I'm really very happy to be here. This is kind of the culmination of my life. I started out going to libraries in Brooklyn when I was a child, from the time I was four. So they're very special places for me to be in a library. Although I ended up working in the arts, not as a librarian, or an English teacher, which I could have been. <laughs> and uh, I'm really very, very happy to be here. This book, in a funny way, is a, a culmination and a nice way to spend the, the end of your, your life years, which I'm at that point right now. And, uh, and you, wouldn't know. you wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not ready. <laughs> but I uh, had a very, very long and wonderful life working in the arts. And the thing I was always drawn to were artists. And I was very lucky starting out in the 1970s. Because what had happened is the 1960s was a birth of conceptual art and where many of the public artworks were men and women on horses, sticks and stones and steel. Conceptual artists wanted to do their own thing. They wanted to make places and make stories and create their own art in places. And I fit right into that because by coincidence, I went to work at Pace Gallery. Uh, my husband kind of threw me out of the house and said, get a job. <laughs> And I liked the artist at Pace, and I said, that's where I want to work. And they somehow uh, hired me for various crazy reasons. That's another whole story. But as you know, Pace uh, had an artist named Louise Nevelson, and I consider her my mentor. And Louise always felt she was an architect, an intuitive architect, and she wanted to start out by making public art. And the other artist who became my very special artist was a man called David von Schlegel. And he had done some beautiful sculptures. At first, there wasn't a name for it then, but they were the first site-specific artworks at Storm King. And David was the teacher of the master's class. As he said, I had to get a job so that I could raise my family, so I got a job teaching. And I'd meet the students and say, look, you do your work, I'll do my work and then we'll talk about art. And he was a very great influence on me and a great public artist. So I started out, I guess, at the top of the world. And fast forward a few years, and uh, I met Brian Toll. <laughs> well, she sort of met Brian Toll. <laughs> well, that's a long story. <laughs> well, it won't take too long telling you. But I think it's very important. I, I mean, these fun, these project, the projects appear to be very, very well organized and orchestrated, and 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 that's not always the case. And, and, and in the twenty odd years that I've been making work in public places, I've come to rely very heavily on serendipity. You never know where a project's going to come from. You never know where it's going to end up going. And I was, without exaggeration, the very last person to submit my qualifications for the Irish Hunger Award. Um, I met Joyce's son on jury duty. <laughs> Just by coincidence. We, we were both sequestered together. Uh, so we had breakfast, lunch, and dinner together. Federal drug case. And um, we got to talking about what each other did. He was a doctor and I was an artist. And he mentioned that his mother, Joyce, was an artist, an uh, art consultant. And um, when I got out of jury duty, I called my, my then dealer, Stefano Basilico and said, who is Joyce Schwartz? And he said, she's an art advisor. She's been in here for all of your exhibitions. She knows your work really well. Well, within 24 hours or so, the phone rang, and it was Joyce saying, I don't know why I didn't think of you, but I think you might be a very good candidate for the Irish Hunger Memorial in Battery Park City. Now, this is around 1999, 2000. Those of you in the room remember slides? <laughs> Do you remember? <laughs> that there were only two places in all of New York City that do slides overnight. <laughs> and do you remember what that cost? <laughs> I had just gotten out of grad school at Yale. I had no money whatsoever. I had made a couple of temporary projects in, in the United States and Europe, and I had to scramble to get my slides done. I also had to scramble to get the slides delivered because Joyce called me on a Monday, and I think the, the, the competition closed on a Thursday or something like that, maybe Stephanie. 
And so I ran down to Battery Park City, slides in hand, my resume in hand. It was summertime. I was not dressed for business. I was wearing cutoffs or jeans or something and a t-shirt. I was not prepared to go into a, into a board meeting. I arrived at Battery Park City Authority. The woman at the reception desk asked me what I was there for. I said, I'm here for the Irish Hunger Memorial. She said, follow me. She led me into the board. So I'm dressed in street clothes, sweating profusely. They sit me at this enormous table. It seemed as though it was 50 feet long. And I was the only person in the room. One by one, all of these people, very, very well-dressed, well-heeled, file into the room. Sitting directly across from me is a very formal man named Tim Cantor. <laughs> and, and then a woman sat next to me. We said hello cordially. We didn't know one another. And it, when the meeting was full and it was convened, Tim Carey looked over at me, knowing full well that I didn't belong there. And he turned to Joyce and said, Joyce, who's your friend? She looked over at me and she said, I don't know me. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, I'm Brian Toll. And she said, oh, Brian, it's such a pleasure to meet you. So if I wasn't mortified enough, <laughs> so Tim looked at me and said, you have to leave. This is not a meeting for you to be present at. And I got up with my tail between my legs, and I went back home, and I said to my partner, Brian Klein, I said, there is no way on this earth that I'm getting this project. It's just not going to happen. And things didn't work out quite that way. You know, uh, what's interesting about this project is in my very long life in public art, starting at Pace, I never believed in competitions. And the GSA, with uh, the head of it was Don Thalaker at the time, his way of doing it is he would pick three to five artists and rank them one to five. And the first artist that they picked, who didn't always know they were picked, would get a chance to make a proposal. I found over many, many years working in the field that when artists are asked to compete, something strange happens. The very, very good, serious artists who have a good reputation and who've done a lot of work don't like to compete. The younger artists may be willing to compete. So that I found that the best way was to follow Don Thalaker <coughs> and pick three to five artists in any project, and I never would have a competition. If the first one didn't work out, number two was there, and then number three was there. And that was the way I spent my whole practice. But of course, the Irish Hunger Memorial had a, had a lot of things going on with it, and it was a very important project politically it was the celebration, or if you would call it a celebration, of the Irish famine. And it, it reached a lot of people. And we not only had the Battery Park City Committee here, and a few of the people are here from that committee, but we also had an Irish committee that was very interested. So we decided to have a competition, and we gave, we picked, we ended up, the committee ended up picking five artists. We gave them $10,000 and said they should if they could go to Ireland, go to Western Ireland and really visit the, the, where hunger started and where it still has its effects in many, many ways. And that's how the Irish hunger started, as a competition. And you say, why did the youngest artist, the one who had not done a permanent project yet, ended up getting picked? It's because the, both the committees looked very, very carefully. I would have been happy with any one of the five projects. I think the artists did a beautiful job in coming up with very different ideas and different responses. But somehow, Brian Tolls, a piece of the old sod, meant something to the Irish people on our committee. It resounded with them. It was what they were interested in in their land. When they thought of Ireland, they thought of I Ireland, and they thought the Irish land. And and that was the most important thing to, to them, them. To them. To them. Not to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, what I mean by that is that um, all of the work that I produce, whether it be in public places or for museums or galleries, they all start the same way. They always start with intensive research. 
and the research is, is conducted not for the purpose of proving a thesis. The research is done as a way of preparing myself if and when a good idea presents itself, that I can recognize it as such. And that research starts with the site. In the case of the site of the Irish Hunger Memorial, it's built in Battery Park City. Battery Park City, as we all know, is landfill. It was landfill that was started with the excavation of the World Trade Center. This happened before the EPA was found, formed. You used to be able to dump things in the river when you didn't want them anymore. And that's exactly what happened. So I started thinking about that, the, the, the artificiality of the, of the land that I was being asked to build on. And then on top of it, I was surrounded by the World Financial Center. You know, <laughs> we had every major financial institution surrounding the site. So here I am being asked to make a work about people who starved in the 19th century uh, in the middle of, of, of the, uh, where all of the commodities were being traded, where Goldman Sachs would eventually have their headquarters, etc. So it seemed to me very, very odd that I was being asked to make something like that in such a place. Um, so, so the politics of land and how it is used became a kind of core interest of mine at the time. And by the way, when I said, when I heard Brian's name and I said, oh, he's right for this project, I had known about his work and I had known that he had this sense of history that went back in time and that he examined the history of a site, of a place, when he was doing something and that there's nothing more historic than the Irish Hunger Memorial when you think about it. And it just seemed like he was the, the right artist for it. And that's always been my uh, viewpoint in working as a public art consultant. The artist is always the important person to me. He's, he's the person, it's the person that I get to know, I want to know more about, I want to help them make their work. I want them to expand what they're doing and I want them to not to give up or take ideas from other people. And that has always been the important thing of my own practice in finding artists. And because I work with so many conceptual artists, it fit in with them. And so I, I found the right place to be when I was at Pace and they were busy, they were happy to support the fact that I could be a director of commissions. And that's a funny story when Arnie Glimsher said to me, I told him that public art was now a new thing. This, the cities were giving $50,000 grants for artists to revive inner cities. The GSA had a major, major program of uh, increasing the uh, scale and the design of their architecture and were going into public art. So it was a very fertile time for public art and we had artists like Tony Smith and like Lucas Samaras and David von Schlegel and Louise who wanted to do it. So it was a perfect place and he was happy, uh, Arnie and Millie Glimsher were happy to support their artists. Not many galleries can afford to do that and let them make public art, it's another thing. And so it was a career for me when I said to Arnie, you know, if I sign my name, they're gonna think I'm a secretary, you have to give me a title. So he said, okay, you're director of commissions, and he was joking. But I took the title, and you know what? It, it affected me. <laughs> I sort of became it, and when people would meet me, I, was, I became a director. There's nothing like a title to help you. <laughs> and it, uh, it, it was a, a beginning for my career. And of course, I was at Pace for 10 years, and had a wonderful time working with all of their artists. And uh, they were great. Louise Nelson was an artist who really wanted to make always everything she thought of, whether it was a, a, an exhibition space, was a whole installation. It was the way her mind worked. And most artists who do public art also have that sense of architecture and design and space and placemaking. And that's one of the ways that I kind of look at an artist's work and feel they can make public art. And so when I met this young Brian Toll, I was 35. He could do it. <laughs> were you were young. I was 35, yeah. That's young. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, tell me. that's very young. I know what young is now. <laughs> right. Well, you're still young. Well, it's all relative. It's all relative. But I, I, I've worked with a lot of uh, art advisors and curators over the years, and they all have very, very different methods, and they all have very different styles. 
and some of them are very demanding and some of them are leading and others of them um, are much more open uh, and give free reign to the artist. But, but the difference is, is, the, is the amount of experience that that person who's helping you develop this project has. And, and, and Joyce has a very, very light touch, but she has a huge uh, uh, bank of knowledge. And she comes to the table with that knowledge and she uses it when it's appropriate. She doesn't use it to steer you. She uses it to help you uh, guide your, you know, yourself through the project. And so it, it, it's, it's a very, very different kind of relationship, I think, that you've established with all the artists that you've worked with over the years. I mean, oftentimes they end up in friendships, like ours. Yes, well, it's interesting. I remember a couple of times I've had an artist come to me and say, I know exactly what to give the public. I find out what they want, and I give them what they want. And that's not the artist I take. Because I, I found that the public wants what the past told them about. And public art has to be pro progress. And the artist who are allowed to do their own work eventually make public art that the public loves and accepts and to change the public space and it changes people life. By the way, we talk about public art, but public art is the experience that one person has with the work of art that happens to be in a public space. So it's a very personal experience when you see a work of public art. It's not a group experience. And I have found that one of the things that I really try to do, and I think Brian has expressed it very nicely, is encourage the artist to do their work and try to find the right artist for the right project. And I've been very lucky because I've had a long time to spend and hone my skills. And I do develop relationships with artists. I mean, it was very nice working in a gallery and selling a work of art on a wall. That's one kind of experience in the art world. But doing a public art project, you do get to know the artist. You get to help them. You, you can usually spend a year or two. It could even be more. Uh, and, and you become part of the process. And it suited my personality to be someone who was involved with art making. Maybe secretly I wanted to be an artist who wasn't good enough. I think that could be it too. But uh, working with Brian was a very unique experience. And even though it sounds like a little bit of a joke that we met because my son and he were on jury duty. But the minute I heard his name, I said, oh, he's right for this project that I was just starting. I, I didn't have to investigate. Going back to the whole point about only having done a number of temporary public projects, I had done a project in New York called The Witch Catcher at the Metro Tech Center with the Public Art Fund. I was lucky enough to work with the great curator Jan Hoot in Belgium, where I did a project called Eureka. And so I made large scale projects, but they were temporary. And so when I was asked to, to submit my qualifications for the Hunger Memorial, it caused me a great deal of anxiety. Because there's one thing, it's one thing to produce a temporary work. So you can engage your public on a temporary basis knowing that at some point in time it's going to go away. The idea that this thing was going to be here for a very, very long time made me very anxious. And so part of the, um, the driving force behind my design process was about uh, creating something that was in some ways uh, vulnerable something that required maintenance, which is not something that clients like to hear. <laughs> but, but it did, in fact, require a lot of maintenance. So the idea that that landscape has to remain fallow, the landscape has to remain abandoned, the idea that uh, the plants that are on the surface are, in fact, uh, unhybridized versions of the plants that we've come to know, like geraniums and, and irises and so forth. Um, the aesthetic integrity of the landscape was so important. Uh, at one point, we were offered, I think, 40,000 tulips to make the place look a little bit better. Um, uh, but so too was the case. I mean, the thing that caused me the greatest anxiety and it took the longest to resolve was the text. Because um, I did not, I was not an historian. I was an artist who was interested in history. But I had no interest in officiating over what that thing said. 
and I did not want to inscribe for all time my opinion of what those events meant, especially since they continue to be so contested and controversial. Um, so we, the one thing we have to keep in mind, it was a one year design build. So my project was accepted and we were expected to finish it without one year without any engineering having been done. So um, we were moving forward and we kept on stalling and leaving things unfinished. And at the end, we had to move forward and we put bands of glass among those layers of, of limestone and we left them empty thinking that maybe we could come in later and um, engrave something after the fact. And we had a very good graphic artist who laid out all the text for us, Rocco Piscatella. And he came one day with the final text, the size, the point size, and the font. He went inside the memorial and he taped it to the back of the class. And it cast a shadow on the back of the frosted class and it was perfectly legible. And that became the answer for that, for that problem. Cast a shadow, not engraved, not permanent, mutable. It can be changed, it can be rearranged, it can be added to, it can be subtracted from. But that took forever to do. And, and people like Joyce and, and the people at Battery Park City Authority had the, the patience, even though we were on such a tight schedule, to allow me the time to get the right solution as frustrating as it was for everybody. <laughs> well, public art is a, a difficult story. And most of the projects I've had have little stories like this. In fact, one of the first projects I did was with the artist Romain Bearden. And he was in a subway station. Well, before we um, could complete the project, the subway station had to be fixed up. That's the, the whole point of the artwork. It took almost 15 years from beginning to end. And it was a, a very exciting project for me. It was, by the way, one of the projects that uh, I think gave a renewed life to Art in the Subways, which I think is expanding today and, and is really incredible. And in my book, I do go into subway projects. And what happened with uh, the subway, when they were deciding to do a subway program, they asked uh, me to do one of the first projects. And it was a mural project. They decided in the subways, they mostly will do tile projects. That's suitable, that was the history of it. And I asked Romain Bearden, and we went, uh, we went up to the site in the Bronx, the two of us, and to look at the site. And we came up there and we found they had these big windows filled with heavy duty glass. And we were going thinking of putting murals around the windows. And I turned to Romy and I said, uh, have you ever thought of stained glass? He said, no, but that would be fabulous. <laughs> and that's how the project turned into stained glass. So I'm really telling you this because you, as a consultant, you have to be open to what the artist can do, how new things can happen. You, you can't come with a fixed idea in a project if you want it to be something very special. And of course, it ended up being stained glass. And when we went to a, a very interesting man who had done stained glass in all of the churches, Ben Wadhill Sewell, and we said, this is in a subway, we want to put stained glass. And he said, don't worry, there's something called faceted glass and you can hit it with a sledgehammer and nothing will happen. And that's how we sold it to the subway people. He said, you can hit it with a sledgehammer and it will last. And of course it has lasted and it's there. And uh, unfortunately, um, Romy died just before we, the pieces work was finished but it hadn't been installed because they didn't finish fixing up the subway. And uh, Jill Sewell was there to s supervise it, the stained glass man. And it's still one of, I think, one of their outstanding projects by an outstanding artist. And I hope if you ever get a chance to see it, you can. We tend to know the, the subways that we uh, get off and on, on our own, and we don't necessarily go to see all of them. We should uh, take a tour of the subway art. It's getting better and better and better. Uh, Sandra Bloodworth is doing a, a very good and interesting job in getting the subway to do more art 
and making it a, a, a factor in, in how the subway grows and is appreciated. And I, I think that's what I really like about public art. It, it poses a problem very often. Very often it's a political statement. In fact, one of the interesting political statements that I, should I tell them about it? Yeah. Which part? My, um, David. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, uh, I, I think we're all very familiar with Michelangelo's David. You can't go to Florence without going, making a, a beeline to see David wherever it is. It's now, uh, there is a David in the station, but they, uh, in the city for everybody to see, but they've taken the original David and put it away. But that was originally a political statement. David, Florence, the small city, up against Rome, Goliath. So it started out a political subject, but an artist like Michelangelo created a Renaissance artwork for all time. And now fast forward here, I'm thinking, I would like to get my book banned in Florida, my descendants. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll sell a few more books. It was just by coincidence, my book is, uh, if you've had it, uh, seen it yet, or it, it's two things. It's about practices and about projects. And to divide the two books in one book, I thought, well, what would be the most outstanding public art of all time that everybody would recognize and appreciate? And of course, Michelangelo's David. So we divided the book with Michelangelo's David. I didn't have anything about uh, DeSantis at the time. We didn't even know he <laughs> existed. So there's a, uh, a piece of grape leaf, uh, fig leaf in the back of the book that you can buy today. <laughs> if it gets shipped to friends in, in states like Florida. Send me for his birthday. Maybe. Do you want to tell us a little more about some of your projects as an artist? Which, 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 which aspects? Well, the one that you just did in Brooklyn. Oh. Well, talk about taking a long time. I, I, did, a, <laughs> I did a project uh, on Flatbush Avenue and Tillery Street called Pageant. You may have all seen it at some point. It's, it's two uh, Beaux-Arts sculptures, one representing this Brooklyn and the other representing this uh, Manhattan. And they were originally designed by Daniel Chester French. And they were removed in 1960 by Robert Moses. Uh, when he was trying to develop something called the Trans-Manhattan Expressway, which would have destroyed what we've come to love in Soho, right? So he was gonna plow right through House and Street and destroy <laughs> pretty much everything in its path. And he started on the Brooklyn side because he had built the BQE, and he was able to, because Brooklyn at the time was not quite as organized as Manhattan in terms of its historic preservation, and he destroyed the entrance to the Manhattan Bridge. And uh, I, I think a lot of people wonder why the Manhattan side is as beautiful as it is and how the Brooklyn side was this chaotic mess of a place. Uh, and they hired Donna Walkavich, landscape architect, to do a, a whole rethinking of the pedestrian usage in that part of the city, in that part of, the, of, of Flatbush Avenue, and they commissioned me to make a work of art. So it occurred to me that it might be an interesting idea to bring back some form of those two original Daniel Chester French sculptures. But other than you know placing them either side of the roadway, I decided to put them on the median and rather than them have you know having them look off stoically opposite of one another as they originally were presented, I put them on top of a stanchion and uh, activated them. So the two sculptures are quite close to one another and they rotate uh, and gaze into each other's eyes as they survey the surrounding landscape. Um, but for whatever reason, uh, political and otherwise, it took nearly 10 years to, to realize. And uh, there were so many back and forths in terms of the, polit the politics of, of Brooklyn and uh, the construction schedule, and, uh, but we, we stayed with it, and I think ultimately it ended up being a, a beautiful project. Um, one, of the, one of the most uh, negative experiences I can talk about 
um, was a project that I did in Miami Beach called Tempest, which was uh, ultimately vandalized to the point that we had to remove it and uh, ship it over to Crystal Bridges, who graciously accepted it as a permanent uh, work in their collection. But it was not maintained, and we had to take it out of that, that particular environment. So you never know what's going to happen to your work. I mean, the Irish Hunger Memorial, for example, uh, when it was first built, had a roadway that ran around it. And we had an incident one day where a drunken driver crashed his car into the memorial nearly killed the family and crushed the corner of, 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 of the sculpture. And um, they saw that post 9-11 as being a security breach and it could very easily have been a terrorist attack. And so now when you visit the Irish Home Memorial, that entire traffic circle that once ran around it and was open to the public has been completely paved over. And there are planters on the south side which are in fact uh, security buffers to protect all of those buildings south of, of the memorial. So um, you never know what the life is going to be of a public work once the public is, is unleashed on it. Well, actually, uh, that's one of the things I talk about in my book. It's about my projects, but it also is about the history of public art. And when, I don't know about uh, you know, people here, but whenever I travel, what I go to see is the public art, the historic public art of any city that I'm going to. It is the culture of the city. It gives you the history of the city. So public art has a life of its own. And yet, in public school systems, when we teach art, if there's a little financial problem, the first thing that goes is the arts. And I have had such a different experience with the arts that I, I hope my book affects people so that they know that art is important to them, even if they're just in the general public and they're not a, uh, someone who's involved in the art world. And that's what I find with public art. When I speak about public art and lecture over the years, the people in the audience take ownership of the art that's in their city. They don't have to be art people. So I, I, that makes me feel very good because it gives me a, a sense that what I'm doing has a life beyond just getting something done and created. And I, I know many, many art people are here in the audience now and I think you should all feel very good about being part of the real history of the world, which is the cultural and the art history of the world. And, uh, and I hope my book uh, helps a little bit like that for people to understand that, that history and where it is going right now. And it's been a life for me in an interesting way. And, uh, and I like the fact that I've been able to get to know so many of the artists and given them an opportunity to realize their dreams of being an artist. And I, I think it's been the most significant thing and I'm glad that Brian is here because he exemplifies uh, the artist as someone who takes charge of his world and wants to make it a better place. And I also found that with Louise Nevelson, of course, who was my mentor. And she also said when she was three years old, she knew she was an artist and she was gonna make art. She didn't have to be educated to be an artist. And most of the artists I know, maybe they study art, but most of them, became an artist because they had something magic in them. And that's what I find I'm looking for. It's not the subject or anything, it's that there's something that they have and they communicate it to us. And it's been a very good life for me to get to know so many artists so well because Public Art has given me the opportunity to work with them, as you can see with the world, maybe in the years sometimes, and then we also rush through things very, very quickly, and that makes it even easier. And uh, I, I hope you read the book because I had a good experience with the artist. But I also, uh, in the book, I put places that were very inspiring to me. Storm King mm -hmm. is one of the, um, I think, most interesting places in the people of Peter Stern and David Collins, who did so many projects there, gave the artist also 
the wherewithal to find the place where they wanted to put the yard. And if they didn't have enough land, they would buy a few more acres so that they could expand it. And also in Italy, there's a place called uh, Villa d'Este Fattoria. Uh, Giuliano Gori is a, um, I guess a businessman who decided he wanted to do public art in his uh, gardens, and he had a lot of gardens, and he wanted to bring artists from all over the world. And if you ever travel to Italy, to Florence, I recommend that you go there because each of the artists was given as much money as they wanted to make whatever they wanted to make. And they were told to find the land they wanted. And that's another way for an artist to express themselves uh, in the world. And Storm King and Villicelli and uh, in San Diego, they have a wonderful art program where the artist is the, the person who is given the freedom to make their art, and we all benefit. And uh, that's been the, the lesson of working in public art for me over time. And it's been an important one, and, uh, and I hope it's made a dent in, in the world wherever these works pop up. beautiful conversation. It's really, thank you so much, Joyce, well, for you, bringing uh, public art and um, humanity um, into this world. It's so beautiful. Um, I'm looking at your cover of the book, and you're in the clouds. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is where art starts. Well, that's Imagination. Robert Morris' work in Pittsburgh. <laughs> it, it's beautiful. But your feet are very much on the ground. Knowing you, you're very much about making it happen. Was there any project you wanted to make happen but didn't happen? Many. Oh. <laughs> well, tell us about one that you still want to do and we will all get there to help you. Oh, I, I don't know. I, I can't even remember. But uh, things happen in the process and they don't you know, uh, get realized. But uh, th there are many projects like that, but they never got so far advanced that I felt uh, we lost a project when it was just ready to happen. It's mostly the process that's affected by it because it's a complex process. It's a political process. There are lawyers involved. There are uh, citizens involved. It, it, it's not that the artist makes a work of art and then ships it by the shipper to a gallery. It's a much more complex project. Uh, I, I will tell you, also I work with committees. The art is not, I don't pick the artists. Most percent for art programs, which are, you, know, what you have a committee that's given to you sometimes. I do have a, what I call the tricks of the trade, and when I'm forming a committee in a, in a city somewhere in the United States, I always have what I call the outsider, someone who is knowledgeable about art who doesn't come from the city. Because what happens in a committee room, if everybody knows each other, someone just can make a negative remark, like a Joel Sapiro that somebody said, oh, that looks like a Gumby. Well, that was the end of the, <coughs> the project. And so I, I am very careful when I have my committee when I work with committees that we do it, we write things down and I don't let people just talk off the top of their head and change the way people are thinking. I like people to focus on the art that they're looking at, write it down and make good decisions. And it's a process working with a committee. And I had, there was one committee I had that put almost 50 people <laughs> in a committee because everybody has to be represented. But I had a very, 
business-like way of handling the committee so that they focused on the art they were seeing, not their own little fun and games that sometimes people play in a committee. So it's a process that's rather interesting. And, and, uh, you know, one of the ways that, um, that I've learned to cope with some of the more negative aspects of making work in public places is to treat everything as information. So someone might say the most, the most heinous thing about me or what I make, and rather than take offense to that, I just listen to what their viewpoint is and use it in the same way that I might use a more positive remark. It's just information. And so I work really hard not to take those kinds of comments personally. Uh, and use them as best I can to make the work better, if possible. Hi. Um, this is really nice, and I'm glad I came. Um, <laughs> so I, I liked hearing from both of you about how funding came from you know, different layers of government or from the gallery. I'm just curious to hear, you know, your thoughts on what role serious collectors might play in creating public art, right? Um, and maybe what advice you might have to collectors that are interested in contributing to that. Well, I can tell you that uh, certain cities have fabulous public art projects. And one of the cities that I consider my role model is Chicago. And if you know anything about Chicago, uh, collectors, important, two or three very important collectors, decided to set up the Committee for Public Art. And they did the first few projects in the city of Chicago. And because they were very serious collectors, and they also understood art, they were educated, the first two projects that were done in Chicago in public spaces was Joan Miro and Mark Chagall. Mm -hmm. And that set the standard for Chicago from then on. And then when they would move into younger artists, that was the standard the artists had to pay attention to. There are many, many cities I will go into and the committees will say, oh, we have to give our local artists the, the first chance. We have to take care of our local artists. And be quite frank with you, if they do that, sometimes it never gets beyond the quality of the local artist work of art because they don't think in big ways. And public art has lasting, it's there forever in the community and it should be our very, very best art because it educates our eyes and our hearts and our minds. And so I try to set a very high standard for the art that I'm doing. And most of the committees will understand that once you start talking about it and you educate them. And I don't do quick committees. I usually have, uh, I, I stretch them out. So we have time to get to know the committee, to talk about things, to have people understand what they are and to have the educated people who are in the committee, the curators who are part of the committee, have their say. So in, from my standpoint, um, collectors have been very, very uh, generous with me often and very, very helpful to me often. So in the case of that um, project that I described earlier in Miami, it was a collector who came to my aid paid for the full restoration of the project after it had been destroyed by the public and donated it to Krista Bridges. So that person became my advocate and he saved a piece of work from, from disappearing. Um, I've also had other, another collector um, who is in the construction business, influential in, in development, um, who has on a number of occasions put my name forward for public projects. So collectors can be a very, very um, important advocate for people like me, yeah. Collectors are artist-oriented. Well, first, uh, congratulations, Joyce. 
It's a huge achievement. Very sweet. We can say the words, but it's many, many years, many, many projects, much sensitivity, sought work, big and grand to you too, Brian. There are many aspects about public work that are different from museums and galleries. I liked very much the way you said it addresses the individual. You can say that about other kinds of art too, but in a public space, you may see it on the way to work, you may see it on the way home, you may not see it on weekends, somebody else may see it and talk to you. It has a kind of repetition, different weathers, different times of day, you're in a different mood. The possibilities for real, individual, personal experience of art are the treasure of public art. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I'm sorry I was late, but I do have a copy of your book. It was a gift from you. And um, I read it, and there were many aspects of the book that I truly enjoyed. But at the same time, I feel that public art doesn't really allow the diversity that it needs. I have been curating public art for 25 years, and I have struggled for those 25 years. I hear from one side, why are you doing this and presenting art in neighborhoods of color? And then I have other people telling me, in neighborhoods of color, why are you showing all types of artists and not just artists of color. So I'm always in between. I've never let that affect me. I get in lots of trouble. I don't care. I do what I think is best. But I like the previous question about collectors. I think it would be very helpful because to do public art, particularly in New York City, is very difficult. The rules are overwhelming. The demands are excruciating. And if more collectors were to partner with more curators, we might have more public arts. I was just wondering what you might think about that. I, I, I think it's a great idea, and that's why I do mention in the book Chicago, because I think it's a role model, a role model for cities, and I wish more cities would take on that and use the collectors who are people who are passionate about art. You know, whichever way collectors come to it, they are passionate about art. And so that if they could take that passion out of their own home and put it into the public sphere, we all benefit. And then we have art throughout our cities, which isn't a bad thing either. But to, but to your point about the difficulty, um, Anybody who's ever made anything in public knows, or worked with anybody who's made work in public knows how difficult it is. And, and part of it is that there is no standard, right? So every single city, every uh, state, every place has a different way of selecting artists, has a different way of paying artists, have different contracts to engage with artists. And you, you have to, I mean I have to as an artist, employ you know, very costly attorneys to navigate through the world that I'm trying to work in. Now, if you don't have the resources to do that, you're never gonna have a chance. So um, there needs to be some kind, I don't know how to do this, but it seems to me that it would be very beneficial if there was a national standard, not just a regional standard or, or a local standard, a national standard where all, where all the contracts are uniform where artists know what they're getting into, and perhaps legal services are provided pro bono for us. The, the contract that I signed for the Irish Hunger Memorial cost tens of thousands of dollars just to protect my rights as an artist. And, and, and that's with everybody working toward helping me. <laughs> that was under the best circumstances. <laughs> so, I mean, I think that the idea that artists have to hire attorneys just to read the contract 
to pursue a public project is absurd. And I, I don't know the answer, but I think that that would be a very, very quick way of leveling the playing field to invite as many people as possible to, to participate in this. Yeah, I was just curious about what you just said, Brian, about the artist's rights. And I was wondering if you could address what happened with the Richard Serra and as an example of um, a installation that was a part of the fabric of the city and yet I, I'd love to I'd love to for you to share what happened there and um, it's happened in many other cities as well that art has been taken down because of either public or political um, issues and um, I, you know, well, the story. Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, we could talk forever about that, but um, yes. it was one man who instigated that. Right. One man who wanted power for himself. He wanted to be mayor of New York, right. and he thought that was a way to do it. But and, the, but it's the, and he started this chain of things. But, but the thing is, I mean, I, I don't know if is there anybody here from the GSA. <laughs> Am I going to get sued? Um, well, they weren't fine to me. Um, but, the, but, but the GSA was a, tr it was a true failure. I mean, the GSA was put in place to defend the integrity of, of, of federal buildings and artworks, right? And that was their job. And they completely dropped the ball when it came to Tilted Art. They should have absolutely defended the artists in that case. And, and they didn't. And it was large part because the, the director at the time was an acting director. And oftentimes yes. the worst things happen when people are acting and not doing, right? right? So um, I, I had made, the people were there. And, the and, and the GSA allowed for the judge who presided over that building to have, have a, an opinion over the conceptual value of that work. He should never have had anything to say about it. Now, I had a, a, a I did a federal courthouse in Jackson, Mississippi with Hugh Hardy Associates, and uh, we had a judge who had lots of opinions. And I got thrown off the job because I was trying to delve into issues about the racism that I was experiencing in Jackson. And they were spending $110 million on a courthouse. And they had people who were too completely disenfranchised and they were destroying neighborhoods that were traditionally African neighborhoods to build this thing. And I was trying to figure out a way how to make sure that these people were in some way represented. I mean, my final solution was to have an LED-driven freeze across the top of this neoclassical building that stated what cases were currently being heard in the building and what the verdict was. <laughs> And it would run around the top of the building all day and all night. Long. Now. <laughs> and uh, welcome to the world. Of they today. asked. They asked me to step off the project. So, so I stepped off the project. But they do an exit interview, and I kept them on the phone for six hours. Is there anything else, Mr. Toll, that you'd like to say? As a matter of fact, there is. And it went on and on. It was the most torturous six hours I, I'm sure that they ever experienced. But I was not going to go down quietly, especially since what happened with Tilted Arc and uh, can't happen again. Maybe you should run for office. <laughs> okay, she should know. My first degree was in, I was not one of those people who was born with this magic. <laughs> I actually went to school for political science and hated it and became an artist as a result. Not knowing full, not knowing full well how my political education would, would inform my work later in life. Yeah, I just yeah. wanted to say that what was Richard Serra's recourse in all this? I mean, this is, it's just one example because I know of other examples in other states um, where this has happened. Well, he and, wouldn't allow it to be put in place else. Right. It was a site-specific work. And right, site -specific, of course. He said, that's it. You're going to lose his art. And he, knew, he felt he was famous, and he was strong, and he wasn't going to let it happen. Right, and right. It was a totally political situation. But ultimately, ultimately it, was, it was cut up in part of the way. Yeah. No, it was just about protection. I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
No, I know, but it's, it's, a, it's about people who have, who have positions of power who feel as though that they can insert themselves in the creative process. And that's not the way it's supposed to work, right? And so someone like Joyce is, our kind, is our, a champion for us because in her very, very nice way, she keeps people in their place. Like, she makes sure that the process runs smoothly. She, she maintains the integrity of every project that she works on. She protects, she protects us from them. You know, and, and, that, and we need that because all you need is one blowhard with an opinion, oftentimes very ignorant opinion, to inject themselves and, and, and pollute the whole process. It happens all the time. It happens all the time. It happens 